Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the next two macromolecules, nucleic acids and lipids. If you haven't watched the first video about, uh, what was it, carbohydrates and proteins, go back and watch that one first and then come back here. Nucleic acids are what makes up genetic material, the blueprints for everything we make in our body. DNA and RNA are made out of nucleic acids. We use DNA as a template to make RNA, and then RNA is used to make proteins. The monomer of nucleic acids is the nucleotide. In the case of DNA, there are four different nucleotides. Cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. You can see in the picture here, a nucleotide is made up of a phosphate group, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. DNA and RNA differ in the sugar that they use. One is deoxyribose and one is ribose. Nucleic acids are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus atoms. We've seen most of these atoms before in amino acids, all except for phosphorus. You can see that the phosphorus atom, the P, is surrounded by oxygen atoms, which have charges. This whole structure is called a phosphate group. So all five of those atoms, four oxygens and one phosphorus, is a phosphate group. And you're going to be seeing phosphate groups a lot in this class, so pay attention to what it looks like. Just looking at the structure of this nucleotide, you can see that there is an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen atom. There's also a nitrogen bonded to some hydrogens. So you know that this thing is polar and can make hydrogen bonds. The phosphate group is also charged. So we know that based on its structure and ability to make hydrogen bonds, and negative charges, this nucleotide is polar and hydrophilic. When you add a bunch of nucleotides all together in a long strand, it forms a double helix. The backbone of the two sides are made up of the phosphate groups, and the two nucleotides are held together in the middle by those very important hydrogen bonds. You can see the little dotted lines for the hydrogen bonds all the way up the middle. These bonds work very well for this application as we want the two sides of the DNA to stay together, but we also want to be able to rip them apart when we make RNA. I like to think of the two sides of DNA as magnets. They're pretty easy to pull apart, but when they get close enough, those transient attractions snap the two sides back together. ATP is a special kind of nucleic acid in that it isn't a repeating subunit that forms a macromolecule it exists all by itself. The official name is adenosine triphosphate, and all that means is that it has three phosphates. That's why it says tri, not just one. Here we see a normal nucleotide with just one phosphate. ATP has three phosphates. Remember that phosphates are negatively charged, and like charges repel one another. So these phosphates are just dying to get away from each other. This means that in order to hold them next to each other, the covalent bonds that are holding them together have to be really strong. And when we talk about strong bonds, we're talking about high energy. We need a lot of energy to hold them together. The very last phosphate is held on by a bond that is really, really strong. When this bond is broken, it releases a lot of energy and the cell can use that energy to do work. This is why we use ATP as our cellular energy. Cells will store short-term energy by making ATP molecules and then can move them around to where they are needed and use the ATP. In fact, we cycle back and forth between three phosphates, releasing energy by breaking the third phosphate bond, and forming ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, which only has two phosphates. Then we add another phosphate back, storing energy to hold that third phosphate on the molecule and creating a new energy storage molecule of ATP. Lipids are the last macromolecule that we need to talk about. The first thing to know is that lipids are fats. Lipids have a bad reputation, but they're actually really important in insulating the body from temperature and damage and long-term storage of energy. 
they don't really follow the same pattern of repeating subunits of monomers creating a larger molecule like the other macromolecules. But the structure of lipids still determines their behavior. There are three types, triglycerides, phospholipids, and steroids. These are all lipids or fats. All of these type of lipids are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. Let's start with the ones everyone's worried about, triglycerides. Triglycerides are the most common type of lipid in your body, and they come from the foods you eat. When we store energy for long term, we store it as triglycerides. Lipids have a glycerol head and three fatty acid tails. Notice the structure of the glycerol head area. We do have some oxygens, but they are not bound to hydrogens. The only hydrogens that we see are bound to carbon. Since carbon is not electronegative, the electrons are equally shared between the carbon atom and the hydrogen atom. These are therefore nonpolar bonds, and these hydrogen atoms are unable to make hydrogen bonds. Now look at those fatty acid tails. There are three of them. They are full of long strings of just carbon and hydrogen. Again, nothing electronegative here, so they are not charged and there's no unequal sharing. They are nonpolar. In fact, this whole molecule is very uncomfortable in an environment where there's a lot of polar bonds and charges, so triglycerides are hydrophobic. They hate water. Phospholipids are our second type of lipids. These make up the majority of what makes our cell membranes. These guys are a little bit different than triglycerides. They do have two fatty acid tails. They are just the same as the fatty acid tails from the triglycerides. There's just two of them instead of three. These are made up of long strings of carbons and hydrogens. Remember, the electrons are equally shared between carbon and hydrogen, so there's no extra pulling on them. They're nonpolar. The tails are hydrophobic, but they also have a phosphate head. Remember from nucleic acids, there is a phosphorus atom surrounded by charged oxygen atoms. Because it is charged and there are a bunch of oxygens, this area is hydrophilic. So phospholipids are half hydrophilic and half hydrophobic. This structure is really important to its function as the gatekeeper of the plasma membrane, and we'll talk more about that in chapter three. Our last type of lipid is steroids. These are very important in several areas. Cholesterol is a steroid, and it's imperative that we have it to stabilize our cell membrane. We also have steroid hormones like estrogen and testosterone that play a role in communication and signaling in the body. Remember, sometimes the instructions in our homeostasis loop are hormones. The structure of steroid hormones, testosterone and estrogen is shown here. These are not repeating subunits. Each molecule exists on its own. Although there is an oxygen with a hydrogen on the end, the majority of the molecule is made up of carbon atoms, co covalently bonded. So these steroids are nonpolar and hydropolar. We've talked a lot about polar versus nonpolar bonds, what is happening with the electrons and how they are shared. This influences the behavior of these molecules. In the last video about carbohydrates and proteins, we learned about the associations with polar, hydrophilic, and ions. When we talk about lipids, we have to associate nonpolar bonds with hydrophobic, no charged ions or atoms. We will start to apply these concepts to cells and tissues in the upcoming chapters, so this is an important concept to understand before going further. It's also important to remember that certain atoms might be in a hydrophilic molecule in one circumstance and a hydrophobic molecule in another. Take oxygen, for example. When oxygen is part of a water molecule, there is an imbalance in the electronegativity. We've seen this a bunch of times. But when the oxygen pulls on those electrons, it pulls them away from weak little hydrogen. However, when two molecules of oxygen are bonded together, they both exert equal pull on the electrons. So there is no inequality. This is why water is polar 
And oxygen, O2, the oxygen we breathe, is nonpolar. So even though oxygen is often thought of as being the thing that makes everything polar, in this case, it's not. Let's look at oxygen with carbon next, where carbon is covalently bonded to two molecules of oxygen. Carbon is in the middle. The two oxygen molecules go on either side. They are both very electronegative, and they will pull the electrons away from carbon. But since there's one oxygen atom on either side, it's like a tug of war. The electrons are pulled equally in both directions. So there's no unequal sharing. This means that CO2, or carbon dioxide, is nonpolar. That's it for today. Come back next time to talk about all the stored energy in the covalent bonds when we talk more about anabolism and catabolism. See you in class.